Hello, and welcome to the joy of birding. My name is Dodi Stewart. I am on the Metro desk at the New York Times as a writer at large. I write stories about life in New York City. Um, I am also a novice, occasional birder. Um, like a lot of people, I picked it up during the pandemic, and I live in Manhattan, not too far from Central Park, so that's where I started birding. Um, and I was really excited to see the barred owl who took up residence there, who <laughs> was later named Barry. Um, and I've kept it going over the last couple of years. Um, but we're not here to learn about me. Today, I will be speaking with Christian Cooper and Amy Tan about why birding brings them joy. And later, you will hear about the New York Times Summer Birding Project with our science editor, Alan Burdick, and a scientist from the Cornell Lab. And they'll talk about the importance of gathering data on birds. But now I would like to welcome Amy Tan to join me. Amy Tan is a prolific writer and author of The Valley of Amazement, The Bone Setter's Daughter, and The Joy Luck Club, among others. Her new book out next year will be called The Backyard Bird Chronicles. She's also a board member of the American Bird Conservancy and joins us from the Bay Area. Hi, Amy. Hi. Hi. So Hi. excited to talk to you today. Um, we will also have Christian Cooper. I'd like to welcome him. <laughs> he is the author of the new book, Better Living Through Birding, that just came out, and the host of Extraordinary Birder, a show from National Geographic. Um, he's also on the board of directors of the New York City Audubon Society. Um, welcome to both of you. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Hi. <laughs> um, this is really exciting. And what I didn't know, but I know now, is that you two know each other. <laughs> we, met the, yes. we met in the park. Right. The yeah. last time we saw each other was drenching rain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, we met we met birding in Central Park. Uh, one, one of the other side benefits of birding is you never know who you're going to meet and you meet people and, and you have this instant commonality because you're yeah. all looking for the good birds. Yeah. And you, you meet nice people. Yeah, yeah. Were you looking for anything specific? When we met, I can't, I don't think so. I know we were, we were down in the lock at the north end of Central Park. Um, yeah. So but we actually I, I ran in, we ran into you um, with Mike Parr of American Bird Conservancy and my friend Megan. And, and we saw you, were, you were like this star birder and she's going, there's Chris, you know, and, <laughs> and we sort of tagged along. Maybe you didn't see us, but then <laughs> after that, after that, we got to go birding together in, you know, face to face. So that was well, good. And that, that's one of the other wonderful things about birding is you can do it alone. And, you know, the solitude sometimes can be absolutely wonderful. Um, and, yeah. but then you can also do it with others and meet up with other people. I can't tell you the number of times I've been birding in the park and then, you know, oh, we run into this old friend, this new friend. And before you know it, you know, a couple of us are birding together for a while. And then, you know, we drift off and go our separate ways, but it's, it's fun. It's social or solitary as you want it to be. Yeah. And maybe that is a good way to lead into your birding practice, which is how often you usually go and where you usually go. Maybe I'll start with you, Amy. My primary place for birding is my backyard, and I have a backyard that's really conducive to attracting birds, um, even more conducive because I feed mealworms during the <laughs> nesting fledgling season, and so they're stopping. That helps. <laughs> yes. So I bird every day that I'm at home, um, and for hours, actually. Um, guilty pleasure. And, and, who and I'm always the looking up. Yeah. Who are your visitors? What what types of birds are you seeing? Well, there's a, a lot during migration, but right now it's pygmy nuthatches, <clears throat> chickadees, oak titmice, bukes, wrens, dark-eyed juncos, um, California towhees, spotted to you know, I could go on. There so are a number. I have a what people call a very birdy yard, and I have twice as many during migration. That's amazing. And what about you, Chris, in terms of like how often you go and where you like to go? Well, my friends mock me for being a fair weather birder um, <laughs> because come the spring, I am in the park 
every morning during the spring migration, let the crack of dawn for hours at a time. But come the winter, I'm like, oh, hell no, I'm not going out there with the, with the freezing cold. Um, in fact, what I do now is I, I, I will spend the winter out in Palm Springs in Southern California, if I can, um, where it's desert and it's warm, and I get to, get to see a whole different set of birds. So You're doing your own migration. <laughs> it is yeah. very much my own migration. Um, basically, so the answer is I'm birding seasonally, especially the intensive birding season for me is um, uh, May, basically the month of May, and th that's spring migration. But basically it never stops. Like I was on my roof mm -hmm. yesterday and going nuts were American kestrels all day long. American kestrels are our smallest falcon and they're so colorful and so entertaining. And they were zipping around, screaming their heads off all day. And then they started doing their favorite sport, which is harass the red tail because there are red-tailed <laughs> hawks that nest in my neighborhood and they just can't get enough of dive bombing this big red-tailed hawk that's like three or four times their size and they're just going at them. So um, it was quite a show. And, and it always amazes me that people don't realize that all this is going on above their heads, even right here in the middle yeah. of like concrete jungle New York City, so. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, every place, right. So never, birding never stops once you get into it. You're, <laughs> you're always on. Yeah, I think a lot of people also want to know um, how you got started and, you know, what was your, did you have a spark bird or what was your, um, you know, first birding experience? And we'll start with you, Christian. So to translate, spark bird is the bird in, in birding lingo means the bird that kind of lured you in that you were like, oh, there's a yeah. bird. And then after that, you were hooked. <laughs> so for me, it was a red winged blackbird. Um, it happened because I had the choice in some wood shop class I was in as a little kid of building a, a bird feeder or a footstool. And thank goodness I built a bird feeder. <laughs> and I put that up in the backyard. And I kept wondering what all these black colored birds with a red patch on the wings were. And I was like, oh my goodness, I discovered a new species of crow. And I was all excited that I had, you know, done this biological triumph at such a young age. And then I found that. <laughs> now, actually, they're red winged blackbirds. Um, but they remain to this day like one of my favorite birds. And that, that's what got it started for me. What about you, Amy? Oh, well, I grew up not really looking at birds at all. You know, my parents were immigrants and so there were birds, there were trees, there were bushes, they never had names. Um, and it wasn't until 2017 that I started looking more at birds. I knew a crow, I knew a hummingbird, and I knew what I called a blue jay, which really was a scrub jay. Um, when I started looking, there was one day I, I noticed these hummingbirds. Um, I read this article, you could lure the hummingbirds to feed out of your hand. I thought, well, maybe if I practiced in, in months, that might happen. Also knowing it may never happen. Got one of these little feeders, sort of put it nearby. What, and suddenly they were there, um, the hummingbirds, because it was a new feeder. They had to claim it. And then I put it closer and closer. And the following day, I put it on my hand. And this hummingbird just came to my hand and started feeding on my hand. And we had a relationship. I was absolutely in love. And, and it extended beyond uh, hummingbirds. It made me realize that in my backyard with all these birds, once they acknowledge you that you're there and they don't leave, you have a relationship. And you can do it with any bird. You can, a crow, you know, we all see crows, but if they notice you, oh my God, nature has just allowed you into their domain. <laughs> I love that. Um, I'm going to go like a little farther back and talk about birding and your art because you both have a creative side. Um, and I know Christian, you were very much into comic books when you were younger, and then you grew up and started working in comic books. Um, and you were a writer and editor for Marvel and we're also for DC. Is that true? Yeah. Um, and more recently, um, I've done something for DC and, and that's the one that actually sort of ties into birds in, in an odd way, because my birding yeah. and my comic books were never connected in any way, <laughs> shape or form. Um, but now so, they are. <laughs> now they are. It, it, uh, it, it happened. I, I, I was approached by uh, some old friends who used to work at Marvel, who now work at DC, about doing a comic book that blended 
birding and birding experiences with social justice issues that uh, had come up in, in, in recent years, like George Floyd, like things that had happened to me in Central Park and to other birders mm. and other places and to just sort of, is there a way to synthesize that in a comic book? And I'm like, that's crazy talk. You can't do that with a comic book. <laughs> and then they gave me a title, which was, it's a bird playing on the old Superman. Look up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. And once they gave me the title, just the story populated. So that that's the the one time when when sort of birds and comics collided, and I was able to tell this magical realist story about someone who gets mm. this very special pair of binoculars, a young black man, and what he sees through them, and how it elevates his consciousness, and hopefully will elevate the consciousness of people who read it. That sounds so cool. I, I, this was actually a question from a reader named Charles Flores in California. So he'll be thrilled that you answered that question. Um, and I know that, uh, Amy, you said that your birding obsession maybe delayed your next novel, but that you also, yeah. have, um, a connection between birding and writing. Uh, this is a question between, I mean, from Ruby in Massachusetts and She's wondering if birding helped you understand human behavior better, which is maybe part of your writing practice. Absolutely. Um, I, I have to say that um, what I did, especially with birding, was I started noting behavior and I started journaling this. And in fact, and then I started drawing, sketching to try and capture what those behaviors were. So not as good as Chris's cartoons. I mean, especially in the beginning, they were very crude. And 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 then I started noticing even more and more uh, things having to do with territory, about about uh, courting, but also these little nuances where people, where birds were giving cues to other birds, interspecies, interspecies, and I started seeing how much writing about characters were in fact looking at nuances nuances like this. So I, I did find that, that tie, the observational um, tie to skills you need to have. Not only skills, but questioning. You know, you look at a behavior, you see, well, it's not just eating. Well, why is it doing all this context around it? It leads to questions. And that was what I was starting to journal and, and sketch. Not just being observant, but also questioning what you're seeing. And Absolutely, wondering being curious and wondering which opens your life in so many ways and you do the same thing in writing but that is one of the great benefits i think that people can have um, opening their minds their eyes their lives what do you think about the um community around birding is something i'm really wondering like you're newer than christian is and what did you think of birders before you started birding? I wasn't really well, aware truth. of birders. I wasn't, yeah, <laughs> no, I wasn't aware of birders at all. Um, you know, it was just not in my consciousness. So I wouldn't have said they're nerds or they're, you know, <laughs> obsessed or anything. Now that I know, I know birds, birders are obsessed or they can be. Um, <laughs> the community though is, I never, knew how nice they were how you could be an absolute rank beginner and people were so patient with you went on my first christmas bird count and i kept saying and just i i can take notes if anybody wants i'm not going to recognize any birds it didn't matter you know <laughs> so um so i was the beginner and there are all these people who are really nice i would say that's the trait of birders that you recognize immediately how nice and patient they are. Because I'm saying, I'm trying not to say, where is it? I don't see it. <laughs> and and Christian, what about you? Like, what are, what are your thoughts about the community? And do you think there are stereotypes around birders? Oh, absolutely. Um, when I was working at Marvel, they wanted to put a birder into Barbie comics. So they came and talked to me because I worked at Marvel. I was side by side with them. I gave them all these pointers. And then when they put the birder into the comic, they put in an old white man. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> so um, no, but but um, I, I want to second what Amy said. People are incredibly nice. The, the thing you have to remember is that, you know, as long as you show a willing willingness to learn and a, a passion for being out there, then people more than more than likely will open themselves up. I can't speak about every birding community, 
The one I know best, of course, is, is the one here in New York. But people tend to be uh, uh, um, open if, you're, if you show a willingness and an interest. I ran into a birder out in California who I had never met before, and he was giving me pointers on separating their, their California uh, um, sandpipers, which can be really difficult to separate. And out of the blue, when we just struck up a conversation, and it turns out this guy was a biologist who was doing all kinds of interesting studies on the flowering, the plants, and how that connected to the hummingbirds. And we ended up having this really great conversation. So that kind of thing can happen all the time. Um, now, the composition of the community, of the birding community, is a problem. Not a problem, but it's, it's something we need to do better with, because historically, it has been overwhelmingly white. That has been changing. And I don't want anyone to be discouraged um, because you know there's Scott Edwards, who is the head of the ornithology department at Harvard, African-American man who bicycled across the country with a Black Lives Matter sign on his bike, birding all the way. Um, there's uh, uh, um, uh, Drew Lanham, who is a professor at Clemson University who won the Genius Grant, MacArthur Grant. He's an African-American man who's articulated sort of the soul of us African-American birders for so long. So it's changing. There's, there's women, Karina Newsom, who's a biologist who worked in the coast of Florida. There, uh, there are young people, not just us old folks. There's a, a young undergraduate, uh, Isaiah Scott at Cornell, who takes this entrepreneurial approach to his birding, which is great because when I'm 90, he'll be able to lead me by the hand in one of his groups and, and show me all the birds that I <laughs> used to be able to find on my own. So, you know, it's changing. There are African-Americans doing it. There are people of all kinds doing it especially post pandemic. And the one thing I would say is that it is incumbent upon all of us to make sure everybody feels welcome. That's the one thing we can all do is, you know, make sure every birder knows we have your back. So that because for a lot of us African-Americans, black and brown people, you know, being in public space can be an issue. You, you, you are suspect, you are treated differently. And if, you know, the, the, the other people around you are keeping an eye on things and making sure that you're being treated right, that makes it possible for all of us to be out there and really enjoying ourselves. So birding is wonderful. You'll meet a lot of wonderful people. And, you know, we just have to make sure that we keep our arms open to everybody. Yeah, and I guess I'm wondering, there are a couple of people asked this question, Andrew in Illinois and Kim in Arizona both asked about, you know, the... Um, potential to have a broader appeal of birding. And I think that it's obvious that it could have broader, broader appeal, but I'm wondering like, what do you, are there things that you think need to happen for that to occur? Well, I, I was bringing in kids. No, I mean, I think, yeah, I, Chris and I would agree on this. If you start early and you really encourage kids and their curiosity and their wonder, um, I have kids next door and I gave them a pair of old, you know, each of them old binoculars and, you know, and we started looking cause we had an owl in our yard and they, they got really into owls. And I said, let's go and find pellets. They didn't know what pellets were the undigestible parts that are regurgitated. We found like 12 pellets and let's open it up and see what's inside. They were so Little excited. Bones. They're like yeah. bird fans for the rest of their lives, you know? And that can easily happen at a very young age. I, th I think that's when you can implant an understanding of this wondrous world out there um, quite easily. And when you get the kids, so often the families get drawn in. And so you get the adults too. Um, perfect example, the president of New York City Audubon right now wasn't a birder, but her son was. And then she got pulled in. So it, it really can, can bring in the whole family. It's a great family friendly, friendly activity. And by family, mm -hmm. I mean that in the broadest sense, whoever your chosen family is. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a little hard to know how to crack this nut and get more diversity in birding, but we all have to keep trying it and try all kinds of different things. And uh, if we have setbacks, Keep at it and learn from our yeah. mistakes and our successes. Yeah. Well, the New York Times is, is launching this summer birding project and summer is not really the migration time, but it's still a time to, you can still see birds. Um, are there tips for either of you about summer birding? Um, I can say you'll see birds any time of the year and it's a great time when people are outdoors. 
you know, as opposed to winter or other days when it's raining. But summer, people are out there. They're in parks. Uh, they're visiting, you know, in uh, outdoor areas. So I would say, you know, they can just find one bird. It could be a crow, um, a robin or something very common. And, and they can just watch it. They don't have to just see a bird and, well, that's it. Um, what I also say, you know, people will claim they, they can't have a bird feeder because of rats or squirrels or whatever. One of the best ways to get birds to come to your yard is a pan of water. Um, very shallow, one and a half inches, put a rock in it so they know it's not deep and just refresh it every day or every few days, especially during the summer. Birds must have water every day, several times a day. So eventually you would have birds coming back. And if it's dependable, they'll come a lot and they'll bring their friends. Um, <laughs> that's what I do. And another wonderful thing you can do if you want to bring birds to you uh, and you don't want to use a feeder, or you can for some reason, um, you can plant native plants. That is a great way to bring the birds in. Um, uh, on my roof, I grow some like native wildflowers um, and I've seen migrating sparrows in the fall stop and eating the seeds from those wildflowers. So it's they're getting their little boost of fuel on the way on their journey. But during the summertime, one yeah. of the wonderful things, and Amy was talking about this earlier, is it's fledgling season. So all the all the nestlings are, are leaving the nest and you find them learning how to fly and making, you know, squawking like teenagers, like, mom, mom, I need allowance, I need allowance. But what they're really, you know, they're saying, I want food, I want to feed me, feed yeah. me, feed me, feed yeah. me. And you'll see the, yeah. the parents feeding them. And then eventually the parents are like, nah, you're on your own. Um, yeah. and, and certainly if you're in New York yeah. City, one of the best shows on earth right now is in Tompkins Square Park, where red tails uh, nest and their fledglings are right now learning how to hunt. And they have grown up around people and have no fear. So they are in your face, red tail talks, learning to do what red tail talks do. And it's a wonderful show. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, you know, and if you watch birds, eventually you will see things like that. And Central Park, for example, I've walked past, um, you know, on a pathway and suddenly I'll see a cardinal in a nest, a female, and, and then, or I'll see a robin. Now you, you shouldn't, you know, bother these birds, but if you look to the side, you can't help but seeing them because they're like this far away from you. Um, and then you're aware that, uh, you know, they're going to be these uh, nestlings and fledglings and they're going to come out but but you also have to be careful that the nest is not disturbed um, and by the way it's a myth that if you touch a baby bird a, a chick that the parents won't come back you shouldn't handle them but if you see one that's fallen down yes you can put it in the nest the parents will come back even though you've touched it and so you learn these things yeah. I mean, over the years you learn these things you learn what's a myth you learn what you can do and how the the birds um all over you can help conservation in, in various ways yeah and summer is a time of nests so you can find if certainly if you're in the eastern part of the united states um there are baltimore orioles black and orange gaudy beautiful birds about the size of a robin and they make these nests that, that are like hanging baskets so they're very cool nests you'll see them going in and out and then eventually you'll see the young so there's all kinds of things to see in summer still so one one question um, that a reader had, Robert in North Carolina um, said, have you ever experienced a moment where you felt able to communicate with birds or understand their language? And Christian, you're just saying, talking about the teenagers. <laughs> it sounds like you definitely speak bird. I'm wondering about you, Amy. <laughs> well, I, I like to subtitle birds sometimes because uh, I remember once someone told sent me a, a Facebook message saying, Oh, hummingbirds are so sweet and gentle and kind. I'm like, you don't know hummingbirds. It's the subtitle between hummingbirds when they're at a feeder is like, expletive deleted. You expletive, get that expletive out of here. <laughs> they are vicious with each other, constantly fighting. And I had to put in those expletives. That was really hard for me to do. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, actually, you know, one thing I, I love when I'm in Palm Springs is um, they have ravens everywhere. And ravens are somewhere between dog smart and chimpanzee smart. They are smart mm. birds. Mm. And they have these complex ways of communicating. I can't understand it. They can't understand my language. 
but I would love to sort of develop kind of a common language, like something that I can, some sounds I can make that they can interpret and they can make that. I would love to do that with Ravens because they're smart enough. It would work. <laughs> Maybe Duolingo for, for Ravens. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and <laughs> gestures. <laughs> I, I have one language that the bird, I mean, one thing the birds really understand, and that's when I put out the food. If they haven't come already, I do a, a, a whistle, and that's their clue that the food is out and, and they start to come. And they get very excited, and I can hear them. There's a little excited squeak, squeak, or cheep, cheep, or do, do, do. And then there's one that I'm sure means, hey, gang, come on over, the food is out, because suddenly there'll be four more of the same kind of bird and more and more. And, uh, you know, some of the birds are bilingual, so they understand the chickadees and they, they come as well. It's not a, you know, hey, Amy is out there. It is more <laughs> like food is ready. And that's all you need to, to know. The other one that I think you can communicate in a way, not necessarily uh, in particular words, but in the tone of your voice. And when I have birds at the feeders, I could be standing right there and I can talk to them in a soft voice and say, yeah, isn't it good? It's really tasty. And, and they don't fly away. They just, and you know, they're just <laughs> eating away. And, and I think that trust either, especially with body language is, is how you can communicate with birds. Just be very still and watch. I, love, I think at, that's such a good tip. I love that. One piece of bird language, if you want to call it that, that you absolutely want to learn is their alarm calls. Mm. And the reason why I say that is because yeah. when you heard, hear that alarm going up, it means that there's a predator nearby. So that usually means like there's a hawk or an owl yeah. and you definitely want to see those. So you can yeah. use the other birds to alert you to it and put you on that that really interesting bird. Um, I've, once you learn alarm calls, as soon as you hear them, your head shoots up and you start looking around like, yeah. oh, hawk, oh, someone. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, hawk. <laughs> you know, one of the <laughs> great things, whether you're in a park or your backyard or some tree, if you hear a lot of crows screaming or blue mm. jays or scrub jays screaming, it's probably because there's a raptor there. And in our case, there's an owl that we have and they, they're just screaming and you look to where their bills or beaks are pointed. And then that's your clue where to, to go find yeah. that bird. Giving you, you know, messages. I, yeah, yeah. They're, they're giving the arrow with their <laughs> yes. where to look. And I've it's seen so that cool. in, in Central Park as well. I didn't see the yeah. actual. I bird, wish we but, could you know, just talk yeah. for and go on and on, but we've got to wrap it up. Um, my closing question is just how birding has changed you. Has it made your life better? Has it made you change the way you see the world? I'll start with you, Amy. Well, I started birding in 2016 in the state of despair because there was so much overt racism. And I, uh, you know, this being dehumanized, um, I just didn't know what, where to go. So I started birding and found this, this calming, this respite from it, this restoration. But it also renewed me to go back into the world and do things. Um, I started being more curious and seeing and noticing nature in more detail, asking questions about the bushes and the trees. So it enlarged my life. I, and all I need to do if it's a bad day is I just have to be among the birds and I feel <laughs> refreshed. Fix everything. <laughs> Christian, it's really changed your life. I mean, tell me about that. Well, I mean, Amy hits it exactly right though. And, you know, forget all the, the stuff about, you know, doing a show now or writing a book or whatever. It's been integral to the way I perceive the world since I was nine or 10 years old. And it just changes the way you experience things. I mean, Amy got it exactly right. You know, no matter what woes you are processing, no matter what internal stuff you're wrestling with, when you're out there looking for birds, you've got to focus outside of yourself. You've got to focus on the movement, on the sounds. And once you do that, you start to connect to a larger world and your myopic woes kind of disappear, mm -hmm. at least for a little while. And you engage with this vast otherness that's out there that you suddenly realize, oh, wait, it's not other, I'm part of it too. It, it, it just really elevates your perspective, changes your point of view. It's incredibly calming and soothing. 
Um, and that's why everybody should be out there doing it because it's a lot of fun. So yeah, this summer, take it up if you haven't already. Grab a pair of binoculars. If you don't have binoculars, grab your eyeballs and your ears and get out there and do it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Amy Tan and Christian Cooper. Christian has a book out now, Better Living Through Birding. Amy will have her book out next spring, Backyard Bird Chronicles. And I hope that this was so fun. And I hope that everyone watching is as inspired as I am, because even just talking about the birds, I feel calmer. And it was so much fun to talk to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dodi. Bye. 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 <clears throat> So uh, my colleague and a Time Science editor, Alan Burdick, will be coming up next to talk to you about how you can start birding with the Times and Cornell Lab, Cornell's Lab of Ornithology. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Alan. Hi, did I? Um, that was great. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, welcome. I'm Alan Burdick. I'm an editor on the Science Desk at the Times and an enthusiast of all things science and nature, uh, including especially birds. Um, and I am delighted to have with me uh, Jenna Curtis, a project leader for the eBird program at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And together, we're going to be talking about birding for science and about the Times' summer birding project, which you can sign up for at newyorktimes.com forward slash birds. That's newyorktimes.com forward slash birds. Uh, it's free to join and anybody anywhere in the world can participate. Um, Jenna, hello. Hi, thanks so much for having me here. It's so excited to be part of such a great conversation. Well, thanks. Um, I want to ask you about, um, about the project, but first I want to ask you about um, you and birds, how you got into birding. I, I have to confess, I grew up, actually I grew up not far from Cornell, um, as a uh, as a child of birders, so my initial experience was very much of the being dragged by the collar kind. But I have I've really come around. H how about you? What was what was your journey? Uh, well, as Christian explained, my spark bird, the the bird that got me hooked on birding, I was a. Uh... I was home from school sick in about eighth grade, and I just looked out our back window, and there was this bird, and it was the most amazing bird I'd ever seen. It had a black head, and it had white in the tail, and I was just absolutely transfixed by this gorgeous bird. And uh, nowadays, I know that that bird was a dark-eyed junco, and that they are fairly commonplace and all over, but for me in that moment, that was the bird. I was, I had to see it again. And so I convinced my parents to put up one bird feeder so that we could get that bird back. And that led to another feeder and another feeder and another feeder and hummingbird <laughs> feeders and suet feeders. And, uh, and yeah, from that point, I was just hooked. And it all started with a simple dark eyed junco, but I still love them. Uh, um, well, so tell us, tell us a little about this project. Yeah, this project is an opportunity for everyone to do something that has the potential to make a meaningful difference for birds, for nature, and for people, no matter where you live or how much previous birding experience you have. If you're new to birding or still getting to know your local birds, you can participate in this project with the free Merlin Bird ID app from Cornell. And if you just simply use Merlin to practice identifying birds and saving them to your life list, it's that easy. And that's participating in the project. We'll be tracking that activity over the summer. Plus, we'll be sending out a series of quests and prompts designed to help you become more familiar with the comings and goings of your birds and of the birds in your neighborhood over the summer. And if you're a more experienced birder, someone who's been birding for a while, uh, participation involves submitting your bird observations through eBird, which is a free platform that collects and tracks birding lists uh, with both web and app-based tools. And so the goal for people who are more familiar with their local birds is to submit eBird checklists throughout the summer, which are months where we typically receive fewer checklists overall. Uh, as Amy and Christian both pointed out, there are a lot of really interesting things happening with birds over the summer, but July and August are traditionally the slowest months when it comes to eBird checklists. So by participating, you'll be helping to give scientists a more complete picture of bird populations. And if oh. you're an experienced bird and you haven't tried eBird yet, maybe this is the opportunity to, to finally 
take those birding lists of that birding activity you're already doing and uh, turning it into meaningful scientific data. I will say for, for my part personally, that Merlin app is so cool. It's like, it's like the Shazam for, for birds and just being able to like hold it up and, uh, and discover a bird I, I has, that's been there the whole time and, and know what it is, is kind of astonishing. Um, and, and I will say too, for the time this part, this has really been, this is actually the first time we've done this kind of citizen science project. And it's been really remarkable to see just how enthusiastic, um, readers are in, in taking part and sharing their stories. And, uh, that's, that's really kind of what we want to do at the times is, is help create a community where, um, People can kind of share their experiences and uh, with each other and, and with us. Um, and on that note, uh, I want to introduce uh, the first of two reader participants. Um, the first is Taylor Colton from Las Vegas, uh, who just started birding uh, with this project. Um, Taylor, um, Hello. welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, tell us what your experience has been like so far. So this project and signing up for it was my introduction to birding. I didn't even know it was called birding before this. Um, I had a very inaccurate and specific vision of what bird watchers were in my mind. And I, which, I thought which it, is what, what was that? I had pictured like a group of, uh, touristy people in like wetlands or national parks with sun hats and binoculars toddling on along as a group and looking out for specific birds I definitely didn't imagine it's something that can be done anywhere there's birds which is everywhere and now if I understand correctly you work as a security guard at a Las Vegas casino um you're probably not you're probably not birding in the casino no. um but but maybe a, around there uh, in, in what I imagine is a, is a fairly loud urban environment. Is that, is that a challenge uh, to be a birder in that situation? Or how do, you, how do you navigate that? Yes, it's interesting. I'm fortunate enough to be an outside officer. So I spend most of my time patrolling parking lots, which starting birding in that environment has been kind of an expansion of my observation skills. Um, you know, where before I might only be tuned into the people or the vehicles around me and the greenery or anything else was just kind of a side note. It's It's been an expansion of that. I'm looking up more. I'm listening to not just, oh, a, a kind of a background noise, a pretty bird song. It's starting to mean a little bit more to me. It's definitely true that in an urban environment, um, as our bird our birders in New York will know, there are places where for me, usually the challenge is, oh, I hear something, but where is it? Um, because of the birds that are existing in these patches of ornamental greenery, they seem to know their area a lot better than I do. They know where they're at. They know where their food is. They know where they want to be. And I'm trying to find them. It's definitely kind of, for me, it's very auditory. So kind of separating that sounds from daily traffic, from people talking, from the music going on inside. and being able to identify that has is, is new it's interesting was was there a spark bird for you what 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 um what turned on the world of birds for you the very first bird i identified with the merlin bird app actually was something that i probably would have just called a crow because i didn't know any better but i learned it was a great tailed grackle and it was in the parking lot um and it's a common bird around here i've learned i've seen many around but it was very exciting to me to to know like, oh, hey, you know, not just a, whatever that little thing on the ground is, to know what it is and um, look for it and observe its behavior. So grackles, I suppose. Do you have, do you have suggestions for other um, starting birders like yourself, things to, things to, things you've learned sure. already that you'd pass on? If anything, um, I'm trying to be okay with not being confident and identifying. Sometimes there's times I see a bird or I hear a bird, and I'm not gonna be able to log it, but I'm still gaining experience and, and kind of personal um, enjoyment in being able to acknowledge and experience those birds around me. So 
So sometimes just being okay with not knowing exactly what birth is is where I'm at. Um, well, Taylor, thank you so much for joining us. It, it's really a pleasure and um, good luck with the birding out there. Thank you. I'll be keeping it up. I'll be adding actually some pocket binoculars to my kit to, to keep it up. Thank you much. Awesome. Uh, next, I am going to introduce Elizabeth Tatum uh, from Los Angeles, who's an experienced birder, uh, maybe 15 years or so. Um, Elizabeth, do we have you? Yes, I am here. Uh, welcome. Um, now, Thank you've you. been doing this for a while now, I understand. How did you get into birding? So this would what is is what I would call, instead of maybe a spark bird, a spark event. So when my daughter was in elementary school, we had a Los Angeles Zoo membership. And one of the uh, events that you could attend was an after hours walk around the zoo. And it was led by some zoo docents. And one of them was absolutely phenomenal at identifying birds in a split second that she saw fly over or she'd hear a woodpecker and know exactly what kind it was. And I'm not even seeing these things. And I was so amazed by that, that I said, how, how on earth did she do that? And so it just inspired me to start paying attention to birds in the yard, in my yard or in my neighborhood. And suddenly I was uh, just aware of all the things I was not seeing before, but they were always there. So it, it just immediately became, I would, as other people have used this word, I would say an obsession for me. I already had binoculars, so I was able to look at things if I could hear them and sort of locate them. And then that just um, evolved into getting feeders and guidebooks and uh, trying to plant more things in the yard that would lure pollinators. And that, that's really important to me anyway. Uh, and native plants. And so, so that, that's how that started for me. And I, the first bird I was able to really identify with somebody's help, it, it was actually that same docent. I would see a bird coming to the feeder and fly away and I could describe what it looked like. And she said, that's an oak titmouse. So th those have been always one of my favorites and they're very cute little birds too. How, how long did it take before you felt like you could call yourself a, a birder? I don't know if I remember the exact moment, but I'm maybe within a few months, I would say at least in the first year where I found, oh, if I saw something more than once, I could recognize what it was, or I could recognize the sound that it made, or recognize when something was seasonal, or whether it was year round. So I got better and better at that. And then I was able to, if I was able to start identifying something that somebody described to me, I thought, oh, I guess, I guess I'm a birder because <laughs> I can sort of, yeah, I, I must know things now. <laughs> so it wasn't too long. It, you have to have patience with yourself because um, as Taylor was just saying, you know, you think, oh, I just want to learn it all immediately, but that's impossible. <laughs> have you, have you uh, found a community of, of like-minded uh, birders or, or is, is it something you mostly do alone? The birding itself, I usually do uh, so, um, by myself, partly because some of it is just in the yard um, and looking out the window. But I have found um, before recently a few other, couple other people I would say I found out were interested in birds and I didn't know that. But what really has helped me to kind of find a wider community was participating in the Black Birders Week, which started in 2020. And that's actually how I found the New York Times Summer Birding Project because they put it in one of their Instagram posts and I was super excited about that. And I, that just opened up this whole other world of uh, other birders and naturalists and marine biologists and all these people and a lot of people of color and uh, queer. And I just didn't have any clue that it was that widespread. And that was really, really helpful. So that's like a global community and then also I post a lot of the pictures that I take of birds on my social media and I've gotten more people interested 
And that's really excited, exciting for me. And now I have more people asking me, what's this? Or, oh, I saw that in my yard. Thanks for putting that picture. I didn't know what it was. And so I, I'm happy to be able to sort of widen the community as well. Yeah. And uh, along those lines, what would you um, offer as suggestions for people who are, are getting started birding? And, and, and I'm particularly interested, and I know you have some musical training, so I imagine you must have kind of an acoustic uh, relationship to, um, to birds as well. You know, that is so funny because more than one person said to me, maybe you are really good at identifying bird sounds because you're a singer, which I had not thought of, but I do listen for melodic tones and I'm very attuned to that. So so that may have some affiliation or make it a little bit easier sometimes for me to identify bird songs or um, patterns of calls. Uh, Advice I would say for people beginning birding, uh, once again, have patience with yourself have patience, just try to enjoy it, right? And don't make it a hunt so much as trying to enjoy the outdoors, the experience, the the amazement of seeing birds in their natural habitat. Um, As as Amy Tan said earlier, uh, you're being invited into their world. And, And that is such a wonderful thing. It's such a wonderful experience. And to um, have, when you, you don't know what's going to show up. You might go out looking for something particularly, you might not see that, but you might see something else really great. If you have binoculars or can get them, those are extremely helpful because there are birds who are far away and maybe you can identify them by sound, but it's nice if you can sort of see them so you can notice markings and behaviors. And those are the kind of things that are going to help you start to identify the birds you're looking at and also paying attention to what season is it? Um, is this something that might be common in the area? And those bird apps really help with that. They did not exist when I was first starting. So yeah. it was a lot of get your guidebook or go to the Cornell lab <laughs> website and try and figure it out. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, well, Elizabeth, or, or ask other you... people, oh, ask other people. Ahead. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, or ask other bird, other birders for help. They'll help you. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's such a big and active and and generous community. It, it's 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 such a great resource to tap into. Absolutely, um, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for for um, sharing your experiences with us. Thank you for asking. It was an honor to be here. Um, Jenna, I guess we should probably wrap up shortly, but um, maybe maybe let's talk just a little bit first about, um, you know, how, uh, you know, how the observations that, that people like Elizabeth and, and Taylor are taking, how those kind of fit into the bigger scheme from a researcher's point of view and, and, and how this kind of crowdsourced data um, advances the study of birds. Yeah, and thanks so much to Elizabeth and Taylor for sharing. Those were just such great stories, and they really speak to, I think, a lot of people's experience with birding. I really appreciated that Elizabeth mentioned that development of tools over time, you know, things that Merlin didn't exist earlier. And those tools are actually built with crowdsourced, community-sourced data. Merlin is possible because people are contributing their checklists to eBird, which give us a much better understanding of what birds sound like, what they look like, when and where they occur so that we can build these new tools like Merlin to help transform the birding community. And beyond that, eBird checklists are used for so many different scientific and conservation applications. Um, They're designed in a way, eBird checklists are designed in a way to imitate an ornithological survey that someone, a real real scientist might do. Uh, So it collects information like distance traveled, time spent birding, these details that actually make it really useful from an analytical perspective. Um, So they can, eBird checklists can get used just the way other scientific data might. Um, They're currently used to designate uh, and protect essential shorebird habitat, The USGS is using eBird data to cite wind farm projects. The FAA is using it to uh, minimize and mitigate potential avian strikes at airfields. Um, eBird data is used to model disease pathways so we can help to prevent disease transmission between wildlife and also with people. 
Um, middle school and high school students use eBird data for their science projects, with I, which I think is some of the most exciting stuff to think that the birding checklists that I'm submitting and people are submitting around the world are using are being used to train the next generation of computer programmers, scientists, and fuel that future curiosity. So the possibilities with eBird data are almost endless, and it's entirely community powered. It's only possible thanks to birders all around the world. I mean, it's kind of, uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty old school, I, I suppose, and I grew up with, you know, with the books and, and trying to figure out what this is. So it feels a little bit like cheating to me to have, um, you know, an ID app on my phone, but to know that, uh, but, this, you know, on the flip side, like things I see just in my backyard, those observations kind of go to this larger pro project is, is pretty amazing. Um, before we wrap up, Maybe you can suggest um, some simple things that um, uh, people who are already birding can do to make their observations helpful for science. Yeah, two of the most important things you can do are counting. Counting birds is one of the most important pieces of scientific information that we can get from eBird. And it can be really overwhelming, especially with you when you've got a huge flock of birds or you're just starting out and it's hard to keep track of which birds are which. But your best estimate, just you're doing your best. Don't worry about getting it down to the exact number. Just any number that's close is going to be more useful for scientists than no number at all. Because we don't know if birds are increasing or declining over time if we don't have this benchmark data right now to know how many birds there were in your area. And another thing you can do that's really helpful for science is to increase what we call the precision of your checklist. Try to keep checklists that are shorter in time duration, uh, shorter in distance. Do a stationary checklist that you, if you can. Five minutes from your own yard is an awesome checklist because it allows scientists to link the birds that are in your area with the exact habitat conditions and environmental conditions around you. And the larger your checklist get, the longer you, time you spend birding, the longer uh, your species list is, it's harder to, um, to know where you were traveling when those birds occurred. So we try and recommend keeping checklists under three hours, uh, under three miles long. Or my best tip is if you get in your car to change a location, that's a time to change your list as well. Uh, and those are some just easy things that anyone can do while you're birding if you're submitting an eBird checklist that can help it be used for more types of analysis and a greater variety of scientific studies. That's really helpful. Um, Jenna, I guess we're going to wrap up now, but thank you again for joining us. It's really been enlightening and fun. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks to everyone else who shared today. Um, so if you haven't already signed up for the Times' Summer Birding Project, you can go to newyorktimes.com forward slash birds. That's nytimes.com forward slash birds. This project will run through September and we're eager for everybody's contrib contributions. Um, I'm Alan Burdick with the Science uh, Desk of the Times. Thank you and happy birding.